You argue that what conservatives ought to be working to conserve is the American founding. How uh, should people who agree with that sentiment articulate it? That is, make it uh, make it real. They should understand the forthrightness and the success with which progressives have attacked the founding and overthrown it for nearly a century. And they should understand that by preserving the founding, <clears throat> we of course do not mean preserving America when it was four million people strung along the coast of the North American continent, 80% living within 20 miles of Atlantic tidewater. Preserving the American founding means three things. First, the natural rights philosophy which is that there is a constant human nature. That's the second thing. And that this is best served, preserving the, net, the rights that are natural to creatures of our nature, uh, requires a government structured the way Madison did it, which is to say an equilibrium between contending forces in government, the separation of powers, uh, in order to make sure that the government does what the declaration Second paragraph says it is instituted for, which is to secure natural rights. That's the most important verb in the Declaration. And it simply establishes first come rights, then comes government. We do not get our rights from government. Progressivism, as you uh, describe it in the book, is aimed at, among other things, separating politics from this anchor of human nature. That's correct. And, so, and once you do that, you have unleashed government to have an enormous and enormously dangerous project, one that we all became familiar with in the 20th century. That is, if there is no such thing as human nature, it means that human beings are only creatures that acquire whatever culture they're immersed in. Therefore, government, by tinkering with the culture we're immersed in, can tinker with humanity itself and undertake the vaulting ambition to produce new Soviet man, new German man, to remake the stuff of humanity, ignoring Immanuel Kant's famous warning that from the crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight shall ever be made. Woodrow Wilson, as one might expect, doesn't come off particularly <laughs> well uh, yeah. in your book. And uh, you, this is in relationship to the idea of separating politics from uh, human nature. Um, he, you note in particular that he was the first president to really attack the American founding. Was that essentially part of that attack? This idea that you can separate, uh, human nature from politics, that humans are perfectible in a way? He attacked the founders root and branch to begin with the separation of powers, which he said is an anachronism that we cannot afford in our more complicated society. He, he pioneered the great non sequitur that drives progressivism. And it is that as society, society has become ever more complicated, therefore, here's the non sequitur, therefore government must become more interventionist and regulatory in, in its dealings with this teeming, complicated society of what Hayek called spontaneous order. As Hayek demonstrated to my satisfaction over and over again, the reverse is the case. The more complicated society becomes, the less government knows about what there is to know, and therefore the more epistemic humility, epistemology being the, the field of philosophy that deals with how we know things, epistemic humility is be, not only becoming of government, it is necessary if government is not to make a hash of things. I know that you uh, appreciate uh, Virginia Postrel, uh, the great writer, a former editor of Reason Magazine. Uh, and she made a point years ago that careful listeners of this recording or care this podcast will note that I try to make as often as possible. And that is a reason for optimism. And she argues that, you know, freedom, free markets in particular, uh, help deliver new products and new services at a clip that regulators can't really keep up with. And by the time regulators get around to trying to put a lasso around it, um, there's already a constituency. And we've seen this with satellite dishes, with vaping, with uh, self-driving cars we will soon see. Um, 
and that seems that gives me some optimism for the future that is compelling people who care about stuff um, and the the things that freedom can provide gives them a natural opposition to the regulatory state yes <clears throat> Australian optimism, as we can can call it, is well founded if, but only if, we can turn the tide, and the tide is now running strongly the other way. If we can turn the tide against trusting the spontaneous order of society, accepting that creative destruction, while it is destruction, it is also creative. If we can get people to accept the fact that there are frictions that come with freedom and uncertainties and hazards, real dangers, but that the exhilaration of freedom uh, more than compensates for this. Virginia Postrel once said, the story of the Bible reduced to one sentence is God created man and woman and promptly lost control of events. The conservative sensibility rejoices in the lack of control. That's the point. That is being good is a, is a choice. Yes. Um, there is an intellectual shift, it seems. I'm not really on the inside of it, but among many uh, writers who call themselves conservatives, uh, have rejected a lot of things that seem to be core elements of liberalism. That's tolerance um, and freedom to trade and uh, the idea that uh, nationalism is something that ought to be rejected. They're uh, reversing that and, and sort of backing a form of nationalism. Uh, how do you evaluate that in light of what seems to be a fairly classical liberal take on uh, what conservatism ought to look like? Well, let's begin with terminological fastidiousness here. Uh, American liberals, when they became progressives but kept calling themselves liberals, did so much damage to the word liberal that they quite prudently abandoned it and now call themselves uh, uh, progressives. And conservatives have been reluctant to say what I say quite explicitly in my book that we, conservatives, are the legatees of classical liberalism, you, the phrase you just used. Cla the, the adjective classical does a lot of work there. It says this is not the liberalism of the unbounded state, of the belief in progress, of the questioning of human nature, and all of that. Rather, uh, the liberalism we're talking about is the reverse. It is grounded in an unchanging view of human nature. It is grounded in a confidence in the existence of natural rights. It is grounded, therefore, in resistance to hierarchies and authorities and institutions, political, ecclesiastical, all the rest, that are impediments to the flourishing of individuals with natural rights. We are, uh, as conservatives, legatees of that liberalism, which has become itself an orphan in a, in a chilly world. When the French want to denounce someone like Margaret Thatcher, they say, eek, Margaret Thatcher who is a neoliberal. Well, I plead guilty. I'm glad to be in the dock with Margaret Thatcher. I should say, by the way, in that regard, Margaret Thatcher loved our countries almost as much as she loved her own, said European nations were made by history, the United States was made by philosophy. And it is the philosophy of John Locke and all the others that produced the classic liberal tradition. So when you say that the, the tide is very much running in the wrong direction in the United States, it seems that there are a particularly uh, authoritarian, uh, uh, I want to call them people, not necessarily groups, but uh, an authoritarian impulse that exists on both the left and right. And my deepest concern is they're going to find uh, someone that they agree on. Yes, that will make common ground and will have that shimmering aspiration bipartisanship, which is always dangerous because uh, when you have a majority complacent in its intellectual arrogance, you're in deep trouble. Are there structural changes that, that have occurred in the United States over time that you think have given rise to uh, maybe a weakening of the the rest of the Constitution itself? Sure. The, the, the fundamental one is the abandonment of 
the assurance that James Madison expressed, again, I think it was Federalist 45 when they were advocating for New York to ratify the Constitution, the Madisonian confidence that the powers vested in the government by this Constitution are few and defined. No one any longer can believe, not after the 1960s when it finally died, can believe in the doctrine that we are a government of limited, delegated, and enumerated powers. Therefore, we cannot hope for very much uh, help from the judiciary in pol policing the borders of the government. Uh, the only hope is public opinion. Now, that's fine. We have to recognize that and then rally around places like Cato, which exist to shift the shiftable sand of public opinion. What makes you most hopeful uh, going forward? Uh, you know, we've talked about the tide running the wrong direction in terms of uh, support for liberty, broadly speaking, and in in every particular way. Um, and we we see candidates who are openly promising things that would have easily been rejected by a massive uh, uh, fraction of the country, and may still be. And, and may still be, but even just a short time ago, a, a lot of these ideas been, you're, were laughable. You're right. They wouldn't have been uttered in public. So what makes you hopeful? You're, you're determined to tickle hopefulness out of me, and I, <laughs> so I'll cooperate to this extent. Uh, I'm hopeful because the ideas that uh, you and I share and that I'm advocating in the conservative sensibility, the ideas are true. I mean, that's not a small thing. Uh, that is true in the sense that A, they accord with human nature, B, they're ratified by history, C, we see them at work in the United States, which is on balance an enormous success. There is, uh, it appears, you know, some inevitability in the progress of all this freedom and all these wants being satisfied. Um, as Schumpeter would have said, that capitalism makes us flabby and therefore. Uh, maybe this convenience that we've become accustomed to in our private sector lives is something that we are just mentally tr can transport to government and say, government, please do all of these things uh, for us. What do you think of that? A couple decades after Schumpeter issued his prescient warning, uh, Daniel Bell, a man of the left and a brilliant sociologist at Harvard, wrote a book called The Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism, which are as follows. Capitalism works, and that's its undoing. That is, capitalism produces luxury. Luxury induces indolence. Uh, luxury, indolence, sloth, and aversion to risk. All of this undermines the moral and social prerequisites of capitalism, which are thrift, industriousness, deferral of gratification, a willingness to, to envision a better future, which means a willingness to not be too contented with where you are. So this is an old theme in, in the history of thinking about capitalism, that it undermines its moral prerequisites. The good thing is that Americans at least, and I think human pe beings generally, uh, are wholesomely resistant to satiation. They're never going to be quite happy. Case in point, uh, millions, billions of people had cell phones in 2007 and liked them, were happy with them. Then in 2008, the smartphone came along and suddenly billions of people were dissatisfied with their cell phones. And now we have, uh, what, two, three billion smartphones in pockets from sub-Saharan Africa to the uh, Arctic Circle. And somewhere along the line, something else is going to come along that's going to make us say, good grief, how did we ever put up with that smartphone? So uh, creative destruction is alive and well, and that's a good thing.